Ciao Fabio. Ciao Anna. Today my guest is Fabio Furini. Uh, he's a research fellow at the Italian National Research Council, CNR, in Rome, Italy. Uh, Fabio is a researcher in the fields of mathematical programming and discrete optimization. His backbone research project aims at studying and developing eff effective exact algorithms based on reformulation and decomposition techniques for mixed integer linear and nonlinear programs. Over the last 10 years, Fabio has published numerous articles in top international journals in the fields of discrete mathematics and combinatorial optimization, such as Operation Research and MapProg. Uh, Fabio has been in many places and he's here to share some of his stories. So, Fabio, thank you very much. Grazie mille uh, for accepting the invitation. How are you? Hi, hi, Anna. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Uh, congratulations first for this uh, nice uh, series of talks. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very nice uh, thing to do to like us uh, trying to strengthen our community and to at least keep it alive in this period of pandemic uh, crisis. She's quite tough, Anna. Yeah. I know in Brazil, it's, uh, the situation is not nice. Yeah. In Italy, it's not the best time, I would say, yeah, for right. operation research, but also for the, for the world in general. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So you're from Modena, correct? Yeah, I'm actually also also right now in Modena, and oh. I was born in uh, in Modena in uh, 1982. I'm 39, Anand, yeah. almost 40. I'm from 1983, so you're from the same generation. <laughs> January. Ah, okay. So, 12th of January. Okay. Yeah, 39. I'm I'm doing my fourth is yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I was I I. Um, was born in 82 it was the, in the 80s like it was the one of the best period i think in italy for economic growth uh, and like it was a boom economic boom in, in italy and it was a nice period actually i think they did a large amount of deaths uh, in, in that period in italy so we're still paying for that area <laughs> but they enjoyed i mean people were enjoying you, you know like uh it was a good period for for music, for life, for it was full of opportunities, and uh, yeah, and I. So what did you do there? Uh, did you? I mean, you mentioned music, uh, but did you practice any sports? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, I was uh, playing football at the time, and. Uh, you know that I am a supporter of uh, of Modena, which is the, the football team of my my city. Uh -huh. and now it's in the third division, Anand. Uh -huh. but, uh, so we had a glorious past. Uh, I think in the fifties, Modena went to the third to, to the first division, and we arrived third in uh, nineteen fifty four or fifty five, I think. And then we went back to Serie A, and uh, but now we're in. Uh, Serie C, mm -hmm. and we went bankrupt actually a couple of years ago. So oh, that's that's horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you played soccer uh, uh, like for real or just uh, on your no, spare time? I mean, I was an amateur. I mean, uh, I played uh, uh, many years as a but I know like uh, as an amateur, I reached uh, like a good level, but not at the professional level. So it was, uh, so I played uh, in the 90s uh, and also at the beginning of years 2000. Actually, I stopped playing uh, uh, football when I went to Paris. Wow. It was almost impossible to, to play football in Paris. So, you know, in the city center, there are no soccer fields. So you need like a, like a, a car to reach the like a, a playing ground or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, there and actually, I only had the Vespa, and uh, do you know the Vespa? Uh, so the Vespa is an Italian motorcycle. Ah, okay, okay. A Vespa, cooler. of course. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. No, it's very, very. It's typical of Italy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I bought a French Vespa in in Paris. Oh. So I was commuting with my Vespa, but you know, with the Vespa, like uh, bringing all the th all the stuff for playing football was not so easy. So I quit it. Mm -hmm. 
Now oh, maybe I will uh, start again. I know, I know, I don't know. Yeah, the, the, the year you were no. born, uh, it's when Italy uh, won the World Cup and they defeated we Brazil. Won. We won. Brazil I had don't a dream remember. team. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, uh, so we won the third one, the third World Cup in 82. Yeah. Paulo Rossi scored, we beat in Brazil. Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> the first memories I have from a World Cup was actually the World Cup in Italy in 1990. Uh, Imagica, I remember that. You remember um, the, the, the song, not Imagica, it was nice. Yeah. So I remember. I remember yeah. all, all the, the, especially the semifinals and the final uh, match. Of course, uh, when Brazil lost against Argentina, it was not very good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but but Brazil is yeah. Argentina in uh, yeah. the quarter. Yeah, round of sixteen, or round of yeah, round of sixteen before quarterfinals. It was yeah, okay. it was sad. And but ne the next very it, next World Cup, where we won against year. Italy, so that was good. <laughs> true. Yeah. That is true. But it was not a good year for Brazil. In uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the the team. So you had a good team in uh, in Italy in ninety. Uh, they were like. Enough. Homari was injured, Babette was injured, and uh, it was okay. We had Careca and other good players, but uh, I think uh, it was not really well managed, and it's uh, that's why it was a mess actually. <laughs> so '94 they were more organized, and I'm saying all this because uh, during the early '90s I was I used to watch every Sunday morning, uh, morning for us the Caucho, so the really okay so so but I, it was uh, so you had you had it on television yeah yeah it was uh I, it, we didn't even need cable or uh special uh pay-per-view for that it was just coming there in one of our channels and i that's why i learned uh the na the name of the italian cities because by listening watching games with torino and then uh of course uh milan and other uh Famous team, so I, I got to know where were they from, and the and that's why I that's why I caught I got interest in uh, knowing about uh, Italian uh, cities. So yeah. that was it nice. was the golden era of Italian football. So at the time, uh, like the Italian teams were very very strong. I remember one guy, Milan, Inter, uh, Inter, Roma, Lazio. They were called the Seven Sisters. Yeah, I remember one guy Lombardo from Sampdoria, I think, he, because he I was Lombardo, he was course, bald, yeah. and uh, uh, that I, I used to like him quite a lot when I was a kid. But he, he had a nickname uh, called Popeye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you you no, no, Sampdoria was super good. Huh? Vialli, Mancini. I mean, I think no, they they didn't win the championship, but they I think they went to the final in the. Um, Champions League. I think they lost in the in the final of the Champions League. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned music. Uh, did you play any instruments? Yeah. At that time, I also was uh, playing music. So you remember it was uh, like the grunge area, yeah. like Nana for Jam, Soundgarden. So of course, yeah, I was playing uh, guitar with my cousin. And we had uh, like a uh, small band, grunge band, just me and him. We were also playing in uh, in the pubs. Wow! So we, we organized some little events. Uh, so I remember also one once we did a sort of unplugged, like the Nirvana with the candles. It was nice, yeah. You and you also me. like uh, grunge music, no? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I grew up, then I was listening to Nevermind by Nirvana over and over. Uh, of course, I, I moved on and I, I uh, took more interest in prog rock and maybe hard rock and stuff like that. Of course, I like classic rock the most to this day. Uh, but uh, I mean, growing up at that time, you couldn't uh, couldn't help but noticing their importance. No? Um, so, you did you have the chance to see them? Uh, because I think they were touring over the Europe. Yeah, and... I went to several concerts, and uh, yes, I remember also. Um, so I, I think I was twelve years old. It was the uh, nineteen ninety four, and Nirvana actually came to Modena. So I think they had um, uh, just a couple of dates in Italy, and one date was in Modena at uh, Palazzetto dello Sport, which is uh, uh, like a small. Place, but uh, for concert is very nice. 
And uh, I think I went there as well. So I didn't go in because I mean, I was really, I mean, very young, but uh, I remember, I remember Kurt Cobain, he came. Uh, it was the last year, so he died in 1994, I think. 94, yeah. 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 And, um, but it was nice. Like, it was uh, my, like, one of the superstars. Like, it was uh, one of my, <coughs> my idols. Like, <laughs> I was young, like with the shirt, during, you know, with the, like, the squares, these flanella shirts. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Good old times before operation research, yeah. way before. So, so I didn't even know what optimization was. You had a busy life clearly during the 80s and 90s there, but then uh, at some point you you had to look for a topic to study or a course to follow. So what made you choose industrial engineering? Um, okay, so I, cho I, I went to industrial engineering uh, after the classical studies, so it's kind of peculiar because uh, you know Anna, in Italy we have to decide uh, uh, at the age of 14 if we want to go to the Liceo Classico which is uh, mainly devoted for classical studies uh, or to Liceo Scientifico which is for like scientific uh, things there's also a little bit of uh, classical studies for example Latin is in both but in the classical studies you have more philosophy Latin ancient Greek like you have a solid um, like formation for literature, Italian literature, and so on. So I went to this um, to this path, which is called Liceo Classico, and I enjoyed a lot. So I was tempted in uh, like choosing, uh, for example, philosophy at the university or engineering. So I liked. I mean, also at the time, I like using my brain. Uh, wanted to have something challenged like philosophy and math you know are related yeah so but at the end i think um, i prefer to do something more like so not like uh, something real more real than it was maybe giving me some possibility to also to work and to have uh, like um, an easier future i remember i took the decision when i was traveling from uh, because after the after the end of the show classical I, I i had uh, like a sort of break before we had a very long summer break and i went by car from modena to ireland with uh four with other four friends three male and one uh, girl and i took the decision of going to like uh, engineering uh, at place de vosges in paris so it was a sort of epiphany <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we were discussing because you know when when you finish your uh, the secondary school, you start speaking with the, your friend. What do we do mm -hmm. uh, in life? What are the plans? And I realized that uh, there we had a long discussion, a couple of beers as well, and uh, <laughs> maybe a bottle of champagne because we were in uh, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I decided to 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 go to engineering. And I think uh, I didn't regret it. I mean, uh, it's. So probably the thing that I regret a little bit is uh, having chosen industrial engineering and not uh, computer science mm -hmm. or informatics. Mm -hmm. But also industrial engineering is not is not bad. So it's a, it's a little bit broad. Like we had uh, a little bit of everything, like a little bit of mechanics, a little bit of computer science. So we had, of course, the classical uh, calculus. calculus. Yeah. And, all and everything mm. but it was very large and at that time uh, I had my first course in operation research and the first uh, course of uh, my, my first professor was Alberto Caprara and it was the second year <laughs> he was fundamenti like foundations of operation research and uh, I remember that I liked it a lot like uh, uh, so I mean I enjoy the, the also the like the creative part of, of the subject you know when we, you build the model you try to solve the model in, in a clever way you start you, you study the properties of the model so this part I liked a lot so you have you can also use your creativity like and a, a little bit to study to develop uh, new ideas uh, to tackle the problem from a different angle 
So I enjoyed a lot that part. Mm -hmm. And uh, also Alberto was uh, very passionate. I mean, uh, actually, <clears throat> I think uh, he managed to transmit to, to me at least, uh, or not only, not only to me, but to many people, but uh, the passion for, for, for research in general and for operational research in particular. Yeah. So it was at it was in two thousand and one. Yeah, when I was when I had my first uh, uh, like uh, contact with operation research, oh. but it was one just one course among thirty. It was really a, a drop in the in in a sea. Like mm -hmm. we had uh, so it was the first year after the Bologna uh, reform of mm -hmm. the university. Yeah, agreements and then yeah. this completed the courses before they had like super long courses, very few long courses. And after the reform, they were, they, they put just a large amount of small courses. So we have six credits. It was 60 hours of operation research. And we had 10 courses per year. Mm. So it was one, uh, only one exam over 30 in total. Okay. But I remember clear, clearly that, uh, that course. So that reforming uh, was only for the Bologna course because uh, I, I thought in first place you were referring to the Bologna agreement of dividing the undergrad and masters. Yeah, yeah, no, no, more yeah, or less yeah, at the I same was, time. I was referring uh, referring at that thing, like ah, okay. the Bologna agreement or mm -hmm. or something like. Uh, so they started with my with the people of my age. So mm. before the like the, the study of engineering, it was supposed to be five years, an entire cycle. And with this uh, Bologna agreement, they, they cut it in two. And I was the first uh, first class, mm. first couple of people ah. doing the reform. Okay. And so the courses went from long courses of 12 credits, like 120 hours to 60 hours. Mm. So we had 10 courses per year. Okay. It was a lot, but I mean, we had a little bit of, as I said, a little bit of everything. So mechanics, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics. Yeah, I, 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 I did, I did similar stuff when I did mechanical engineering. I, I see, I can relate totally. And uh, yeah. did you have to write any uh, research monograph to to get your undergrad degree? Yeah. So during the. Um, the bachelor, and actually at the end of the bachelor, I did uh, a sort of uh, dissertation, but it was not in operation research at that time. I did it in electrical engineering. Oh. But after that, when I was doing the master, I did my master dissertation in operation research. Actually, during the master, I had the opportunity to choose several courses. So, you know, you know there, there's a path which is fixed, like, I don't know, 60% of the exams are chosen by the, like, everybody has to do it. But then you have a portion of the exam that you can choose. And I selected, I remember, all the courses in operation research. Mm. I had another course, uh, it was uh, on, of uh, Alberto. It was a very nice course uh, in which I, I, like, he explained to me for the first time, like, column generations, decompositions, better decomposition, all the the classical themes that I used in my research uh, for many years. Then I had another course with Daniele Vigo, mm -hmm. and it was a course on the simplex algorithm only. <laughs> I mean, so you know the pivoting, how to update the basis, reduce cost, uh, all the rules. And that was the uh, course, the, uh, course made by Daniele Vigo. And then I had another. I, I took a course on heuristics algorithms uh, of Paolo Todt, and the professor was Paolo Todt. And that was the last. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I took three courses in operation research during my master, and uh, I I liked a lot also Paolo. He was a fantastic teacher. I think he's still a fantastic teacher. I mean, he's. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, I, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, something like ten year, ten years ago, mm -hmm. yeah, something. Like that. But he's still doing uh, his course on a voluntary basis, mm -hmm. but he's still. So the only prof, no, actually, I didn't have as a professor uh, neither Silvano, neither Al uh, Andrea Lodi. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. But the other three, yes. I had uh, Alberto, Daniele, and uh, Paolo. Not bad at all. <laughs> and also I remember then that the exercises were made by Enrico Malaguti, by Michele Monaci, <laughs> and Valentina Cacchiani, wow. which are now uh, yeah. which are now the associate. I mean, actually, Michele is a full professor, but the other two are associate professor. So I remember uh, actually uh, uh, some pictures. And then I remember Valentina was coming for doing the exercises of the course of Alberto, and probably Michele was doing the exercises for the course of Paolo and Enrico as well. I remember, I think we did some small project with the development of a heuristic, like, for example, the lean Kerni gum heuristic for mm -hmm. the TSP, something like that, or maybe the Satur for the vertex coloring problem. And I remember I went, I, I, this was my first uh, algorithm that I coded, you know, like related to operation research. Mm -hmm. I developed and, and it was sort of part of the exam of Paolo. So I went, I wrote this. And I still remember I printed, I printed the, the code to double check. So, you know, when you write the, your first code, it looks very complicated, very long. You have all these nested for loops. So, but I liked it a lot. So, yeah, you remember, so, I mean, uh, you, you see the black screen with the numbers going <laughs> on. Yeah, you get attracted by these little numbers changing. So you look at Cplex, the gap, which is closing, <laughs> primal bound, dual bound. Yeah. So, but in terms of research... This is our course. Yeah. But in terms of research, what did you do during the master's? Okay. Yes. I mean, uh, I forgot. So um, at the end of the master, actually, I, I, I went to Paolo, to a Paolo office. I remember I went to... I wanted to go abroad, so I went to, to see Paolo and I asked uh, him if uh, he had some opportunities to go abroad for writing the dissertation, for the master uh, dissertation abroad. And uh, he, he told me yes, and uh, that he, he was uh, in contact, uh, actually, uh, so he had uh, many opportunities, but I, I, I decided to go to the University College of Dublin to visit uh, Professor Katal Brugge which is uh, still there. I mean, he's a very nice person. I remember when I arrived, uh, he, he took me to his home as well. We had a nice, nice time. And we developed, uh, I mean, a basic research project on multi-objective uh, vehicle routing problem. Mm. It was nice. Yeah, when it was 2007, uh, it was a super period also for Highland. Uh, you know that uh, Ireland was one of the tigers, the Celtic tiger mm -hmm. was a uh, mm -hmm. booming economy in Ireland at that time. So I uh, really felt the energy of the city and also of the university. It was my first experience abroad, mm -hmm. the first of many. Yeah, actually, I know. You know? <laughs> I had, we have uh, to cover all them here. <laughs> long, long, uh, I mean, actually, it's part of our life. I mean, the researchers now are living a life with the luggage, what can we do? <laughs> but anyway, that was the first one and I really enjoyed it a lot. I mean, uh, so you know, when you you leave your nest, actually, you go abroad uh, and you see a different different way of, uh, of doing university. Actually, it was a campus because in Bologna, you know, I mean, Bologna is a very old university, probably one of the oldest mm -hmm. university in the world, but mm -hmm. It's not the campus, so you just have old buildings, but the students are not living inside of the university. So this is more or less the style in Italy. So we don't have uh, campuses like in the US or in the uh, UK or Ireland. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was completely new. I was living inside of the campus or so sharing the experiences with the other students. So they were, it was full of sports, facilities, the opportunity. I also played for the, for the volleyball team of UCD. Wow. For the Olympiad for the students. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know. we had a match against, uh, I don't know, Iran, I think. So, I mean, people in Ireland are not very, I mean, the students, the, the students were not, not super good at volleyball. Mm -hmm. in, in Italy, we, we are, we like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, Modena is very famous for volleyball. Oh. So, we had um, a very long uh, history of strong teams, volleyball team. Panini was one of the first ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
And um, I also played uh, volleyball. So I remember I was playing for the UCD in the <laughs> in the sort of games. And uh, oh, we did quite well, but we didn't win. Uh, but I think we won one match against Iran or something. Mm. Like that. So you you spent uh, six months in Ireland. Yeah, I, I spent six months in Ireland, and then I went back to finish my master. Mm -hmm. Because in Italy, you know, you have like the, you, you can finish still on time until April, the year after. So you have one year, you have another year, and you can still complete on time your mm -hmm. studies until March. Mm -hmm. I finished in March 2007. Mm -hmm. So I went. Uh, I spent six months in Dublin, and then actually I went back uh, to Dublin uh, for a couple of months later. Oh, I still have uh, very good friends for from that uh, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, going for it was my my sort of Erasmus. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the way, it's strongly recommended to, yeah. to everybody to, to do I Erasmus. I see that you did not start your PhD oh. right after finish your masters. You had a break. What did you do? No. I this is true and uh, after uh, finishing my master uh, i mean you know you i wanted to experience i mean i wanted to try like, some experiences i went to uh, to ferrari actually i had an opportunity to work for uh, ferrari which is uh, the, i mean everybody knows ferrari but it's a big <laughs> uh, car company here in uh, in maranello which is actually 10 kilometers away from uh, my my home wow yeah. uh, super close <laughs> So, I mean, I didn't go to the racing the racing part of the company. I was doing a um, uh, project linked to the warehouse. We, we had a, like a project for outsourcing the warehouse. It was kind of interesting, but um, not related to any optimization, anything. Um, so so the, what, what I was missing is the possibility of using my my brain i mean i wanted to have some challenge to have time for improving the solutions to i mean to get some um, optimization in the processes so that was my 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 formament is my my state of mind mm. actually so when you work in a company so you don't have time for for optimization, for thinking. Actually, you you spend your day at the phone with the customers. We were like uh, looking after the the production lines. So we had like uh, so so a big warehouse. I mean, we were like uh, feeding the the production lines of the cars. So we were under a large amount of pressure. So we had to deliver the pieces for the cars. And you know, if there is a delay. The production line is a complete disaster. So, so it was not a, like it was not a bad job, but not a job that I wanted to do for my life. Then you went. So I to, yeah. So I decided to contact uh, uh, Paolo and uh, actually Paolo and Alberto. I mean the, the two professors uh, of operation research that I had during my studies. And uh, Alberto said that uh, there was an opportunity of doing a PhD, so I was very happy. And uh, I did uh, another exam to enter uh, the PhD program. In Italy, we have a, a sort of real exam. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, I remember, I think, I still remember the, 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 the question. I think he asked me, how to develop an extended formulation for the beam packing problem, how to generate the columns, or uh, something quite technical for not being uh, mm. in the field. Like, uh, mm. I was, I mean, I had a couple of exams, but I think uh, I answered, you know, I, I studied a little bit for, 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 the, for the exam, so I managed to, to enter the program. And yeah, so that was the beginning of everything. Mm -hmm. The beginning of uh, the, uh, my career in operation research and optimization. So that is where you, where you really start for real. You, you think that uh, your, yeah. your journey. I started in 2008. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I did one year in uh, at, uh, in Ferrari, and then I started my PhD in 2008. Yeah, I also started in 2008, the PhD. So <laughs> nice. So I did the grant for three years. Mm. So in Italy, the like the. Um, the normal time for completing the PhD is three years. Then you can stay a little bit longer, but you're only paid for three years. Mm -hmm. So you can, for example, take an extra year, but you're not going to be paid for that. So I tried to hurry up to, to be on time. And during my PhD, actually, I went to, to London. Mm. I went to London uh, to visit uh, the, for, for six months. Uh, at the Imperial College of London to visit Professor Eleni Agi Costantino. Mm -hmm. It was a very nice uh, opportunity. Like and, Mano uh, Iori also did, he went there. My, I, I followed uh, the steps of Manuel. Manuel, I think he went uh, three or four years before me. Mm -hmm. Then I also went. And um, Nico Christofides was there. Wow. I saw Nico, yeah. <laughs> So he, he, I think at the time he was already retired, huh. and, uh, but I saw him a couple of times. He was working with the lady mm. and um, yeah, it was a, a fantastic time in London. Like London is, was, uh, it's a still a very nice city. And also the position of Imperial College is fantastic. Close to the park, uh, close to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Yeah. Nice. My grandfather, my grandfather did masters uh, in Imperial College in from I think between 1952 and 1953. <laughs> wow! Yeah. I went in 2009, I think, and if I'm not wrong, yeah. Mm. No, it's uh, super nice, and also it's not a real campus as the the campus, for example, in the US or in the other campus, for example, in Oxford or Cambridge, but you have a little bit of that feeling. Mm -hmm. So have you been to the Imperial College? No, no, no. I've been to London, but not Imperial College. So it's a sort of neighborhood. You have um, like a garden in the middle. You have a tower. Mm -hmm. You have the library and the departments. But you, I think you have some student housing, but not much. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But you have a little bit of that feeling. It's nice. You have some... Yeah. Some campus life. There is some there. I think some f sport facilities uh, not not far. And I was living in Hammersmith. Yeah, which is a nice place. Mm -hmm. And what research work did you do there? So uh, I did some research related to ports, to AGV in ports. Mm -hmm. I remember I did my also my first presentation at the Euro Conference on AGV. And we wrote the paper, but actually uh, that paper was rejected. Wow. So uh, I started with the rejection. That's okay. I, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's not bad because you, you have to... It's part of life. You, know, you have to get this feeling. Mm -hmm. So you start yeah. with... Um, and then you adjust your, your technique and you get better and better. And uh, yeah, so that uh, <coughs> that paper didn't go through. But um, then after my at the end of my PhD, I got my first publication. Mm. So yeah, at, at that time I was not aware of the the necessity of publishing. So uh, you know, Anand, when you start the PhD. You don't know the rules, like uh, you don't have the feeling or the urge or the, the need of publishing a lot. At, the, at that time, I thought it was uh, necessary to publish one paper, one big paper, solid paper. It was also a different area, like uh, it was not, not different area. It was mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but things changed very quickly in, uh, mm -hmm. in our field. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was preparing was working on many things to get I mean at the same time but I was not in a hurry to, to publish but then at the end uh, I realized that it was basically necessary to publish a lot so I started what else did you speed. do in terms of research uh, so um, 
my PhD was on decomposition techniques for general uh, mixed integer programs. Hmm. And that uh, research uh, brought me to the, to the Mathematica programming paper, to my thing, unique. I, now I have another one submitted, but <laughs> I, so it's, you know, it's That's kind of difficult and really happy to manage to, to publish uh, yeah, the results, the main results of my thesis in, uh, in a top journal like yeah. Mathematica programming. But it was uh, a long journey. I didn't publish it during my PhD. I published the, the Mathematica programming paper when I, when I was doing my postdoc in Aachen, oh, actually okay. after my PhD. Okay, okay. So, so the, the results, uh, so I got some of the results even before, but then I prepared the paper, I mean, I prepared the paper, I submitted the paper after when I was doing my first postdoc in Aachen. Mm. And how in was 2011, mm. yeah, in 2011, I finished my PhD mm. and then uh, I went to Aachen to visit the group of Marco Rubeca. Mm. Do you know Marco? Yeah, he's very famous. I never, I never met him, but he's, uh, he's a quite famous guy. <laughs> no, no, he's a super nice guy working in uh, column generation like uh, since many, many years. Mm -hmm. And um, I visited him for six months. And uh, <coughs> we managed to publish an IPCO paper. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. It was probably my first real paper, actually conference paper, but uh, it was uh, very, I was very happy because uh, an IPCO paper, starting the career with an IPCO paper is very nice. And I think we received uh, the acceptance when I was in Oswa. You know, Oswa is the like, yeah, sort of famous conference, famous conference in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Eduardo Schroeder tells me uh, a lot about that uh, uh, mm. conference that they, they have there and so on. Yeah, so I remember and uh, actually it was during my, so it was 2011, no, I was 20, uh, because, so uh, my birthday is in January, mm. the conference is always in January mm. and uh, my birthday is always in that period. Mm. So I celebrate every year in Oswa. So I was able, I mean, I was used to do it, but now, I, so this year I didn't do it, but so you have to be invited, so you cannot go every year. So it's mm -hmm. a very select conference. But at that time, I was used to go every year and I was celebrating uh, my 29th birthday at Oswa. And the day, the, the day after, I think we received the, the acceptance of the IPCO paper. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, I don't know if it is still like that, but uh, the, the IPCO committee takes the decision on the papers in Oswa. Ah. So there is a, um, because we, so it's a, it's a special conference. And so we, we stay in the same place. So we also share rooms. There's no single rooms. Only the big, big names have a single room. For example, Jack Edmonds had a single room or I don't know, like big superstar. But everybody else, they share rooms. So it's a, a very uh, it's a special experience. So you really get in touch with uh, other researchers from other from from the, the top universities in the world. And in the nights, uh, there was this special room with the IPCO committee. So I remember I was looking from outside what was going on, and then um, then we got the the good news that our paper was accepted. You shared the, think, the uh, uh, room with Eduardo Shoa once, right? Yeah, I shared the room with Eduardo. We had, uh, uh, we had a very nice time together, yeah. I mean, it's a very small room. If you have the chance of going there, you will see. <laughs> so very short, I mean, very small bed. I'm quite tall, and so my feet goes, I mean, way, way. Uh, okay outside of the of the bed and but also in the art, i think he's quite tall i so, think he's one seven yeah, like or two small beds like mm. you know so but it's very nice so so the view is fantastic um, of course like the conference is super good i mean the speakers uh it's a very selective conference and you have top quality it's it was there when you got a treat from alberto uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember, and uh, so actually, I think this was uh, for my 30th anniversary. Ah, so the okay. year after. 
Okay. So, and for that year, I also went uh, uh, for a trip in the mountain with Alberto. Alberto was a big fan of, uh, of mountains. He was uh, going uh, <coughs> on hike uh, every day in, um, in Oswald. He enjoyed a lot. And we went together. And I remember in the, in the night, he made me a small cake with uh, the candles. And it was nice because so everybody uh, had dinner at the same time. Mm -hmm. So all the big names were there. I mean, Paolo Todd was there, all the group of Bologna, all the Germans. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was. But I tell was, me more about uh, yeah. uh, your relationship with Alberto regarding uh, the research part. How was, yeah. how was the experience? Uh, yeah. Alberto, Alberto is a fantastic researcher, was a fantastic researcher. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, the, the most clever researcher that I ever met. So as I told you, this is Alberto is the reason why I am doing uh, operation research. And uh, I always uh, <laughs> keep him in my heart. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, he's, uh, he was a fan fantastic researcher. And you know, he, I mean, I was young, so probably I was not able to really fully appreciate what, what he was saying, but I, I, I realized that um, he had a you know, speed of thinking that was outstanding, outside of <clears throat> not ordinary, I mean, way better than most of the other researchers that I met even after. Mm -hmm. So it was like uh, speaking to a dolphin, like a uh, <laughs> different language. And I also remember when I was when he was doing research with other colleagues, uh, for example, Max, Maxine Viridenk or other top players, and I really had the feeling of listening to dolphins. Like they were saying a couple of words, and then the other one was answering. But it was sort of <laughs> cold language or something. <laughs> yeah, what are they doing? <laughs> and also, he was seeing things uh, way before the others. Like I also remember, so you know, Anand, when you when you have this presentation of like things that uh, normally a normal person can't understand. I mean, mm -hmm. we have so sometimes we pretend to understand, we pretend to do intelligent questions or something to to show to the other people that we are listening. Mm -hmm. But it was not only listening; it was understanding, mm -hmm. so understanding and asking real questions to the speakers and showing that he, he was completely following everything and probably even more. Mm -hmm. So, so you, yeah, hey, it's, uh, it's a pity we lost him. Uh, it was a well, disaster. Yeah. yeah, you, you went to my Germany to, 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 to have my career with him. Mm, sure. It worked to me to write papers. Uh, together whatever yeah that, that was the plan but no. you had the opportunity to work with him again uh, after your period in in germany correct but before yeah. before yeah. we go to that point tell me what you did in germany so in germany um uh, i stayed in Acre for six months and i I finished my 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 paper on uh, the composition methods, the paper on automatic dancing wall that went to operation research uh, to mathematical programming, and uh, we wrote uh, uh, also part of I think the the EPO paper was written when I was in in Aachen, and uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, I didn't do uh, other big projects with them, but I started. Um, yeah, I think with Marco, I have the mathematical programming paper and uh, the EPICO paper. Mm. And I stayed six months uh, only in, in Aachen. Not bad <laughs> <laughs> for a collaboration. Yeah, great. Yeah, but, but I, mean, it, I mean, I start, so the work was part of my PhD. Then we finalized the works there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember because we, when we met, Marco was working on similar topics. So I think we met in Aswa. We had a sort of, I don't know, business uh, lunch. And 
I don't know why he knew that I was also do, I mean, working on similar topics, but we, we realized that we had many points in common and we said, okay, so come to Aachen and we will write the paper together. So it was nice. Yeah. And also, you know, that, uh, now he has uh, this automatic framework called GCG, which is for performing automatic decomposition and a full branch and price algorithm to solve uh, a MIP, a generic MIP. Mm -hmm. And what we did, I mean, I think where was the basis of, uh, of this, uh, this super tool. Mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, part of Skip. Yeah. You went back so to we did Bologna then? Book that uh, GCG was doable. Mm -hmm. so something, an automatic decomposition was possible. Mm -hmm. So that was the big contribution of uh, that paper mm -hmm. or that experience. Mm -hmm. After Germany, you went back to, to work with Alberto in Bologna? After Germany, yes, I went back uh, to work in Bologna with Alberto and uh, for one year. And it was uh, during my postdoc that Alberto died. Yeah, I remember what well, yes, it was spring. It was more or less this period, like in April. I mean, uh, it was living uh, a life at the cutting edge. I mean, it was pushing the boundaries of everything of research, but not only of research, but also of life. It was it was doing some a little bit dangerous hike in, in the mountains. And in one of those hikes, uh, he lost his life. Yeah. Yeah, Roberto Roberti was also doing postdoc at the time with him. So, were you seeing each other? Yes, but Roberto Roberti, um, I think he was not living in Bologna at the mm. time. He was more linked to the group of Cesena. Yeah. At that time, we had like the group of Paolo Tot with Paolo, Alberto, Andrea, Daniele, <coughs> and the group of Aristide Mingozzi, mm. which is another group. Uh, Aristide was a professor in the Department of Math, mm. and Paolo is the, was uh, the, the founder of the group uh, in, uh, in uh, the engineering school. So Roberto, I think it was more Roberto Roberti was more uh, linked to the to the group of Aristide. But he had, yes, we met several times. Mm -hmm. So it was not on the daily basis in the department. But uh, we met uh, several times. Yes, as I said. So at the time, uh, the PhD students, uh, so we had a lot, I mean, um, uh, many South Americans. Mm. I remember I was sharing uh, <coughs> my, my room with uh, Rosa, mm. is, uh, I mean, uh, her PhD from uh, Chile, mm. which is now at the University of Bio Bio in Chile. Rosa Medina Duran, mm. she's a professor, uh, so we're still in contact. And also Albert Einstein Fernandez Muridiva was, yeah. was doing PhD at the same time as uh, I think he, he started one year before me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's uh, he's close and, to Manuel. Yeah, he, he has this very famous name. Yeah. <laughs> he's from Fortaleza. Uh, in, uh, in uh, yeah, he was working with Manuel, and probably yeah. He was doing the PhD with uh, Silvano or with maybe with Paolo. And uh, Claudia D'Ambrosio was there also at the time. Mm -hmm. We were in different levels. Uh, so I was starting when uh, I think Claudia was in the second year or the or maybe, maybe the third year. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But she finished uh, one or two years before me. Mm -hmm. And another uh, PhD student at the time. Also, Emiliano is uh, now uh, a professor in uh, in Paris. Mm, yeah. So, uh, sort of a, more or less the same story. So Emiliano came to Germany. Uh, no, actually, he went to Germany before me. Mm -hmm. And then he came to France as well. Yeah. But also, uh, also uh, Claudia now is in Paris. Mm -hmm. So I think. Yeah, Claudia arrived before me, then I arrived in Paris, and then Emiliano arrived in Paris. Yeah, you, Enjoy. and then I think you applied for a position uh, in Paris while you, yeah. were, while you were still in Bologna. 
Yeah. So actually, uh, so you know, at that time um, there was a big reform system in Italy. So they changed completely the, the levels. Before we had the three permanent positions: so a researcher, associate, and full. Mm. But then they removed the, the first one. They removed tenure track, but not the real tenure track. A tenure track without uh, the possibility. I mean, the obligation of having the possibility to become a full professor, a uh, uh, professor at the end. So then I decided to go. I mean, I started looking for, for found an offer from Bari Tres, which is the University of North um, of Paris. So I saw the, like the, the mail, the advertisement of the position, and I was I did the normal thing that I was doing at the time to check with, I, I thought it was a good idea to share with my, my supervisor, to double check if it was a good opportunity, a good position. So I wrote, uh, what do you think about this group? And then I pressed the, the reply instead of the forward button. So the mail that was supposed to go to Alberto for double checking the quality of the group actually went to Roberto Wolfer oh, no. <laughs> in charge of that position. It was incredible, insane. But it was not too bad because um, after, I don't know, 30 minutes, he called me. He called me saying, hey, look, I don't know if we are good enough <laughs> for you, but uh, we can maybe do some effort. So we started laughing and it was it was nice. And now we're, we're, we're good friends. So we so wrote an email asking the if the if they were good, but you you asked to the guys themselves. So I asked, I asked to, them, to the guys themselves, "Are you good? Are you uh, good enough?" Ah, uh, good and, enough. Uh, that's priceless. That's <laughs> that's amazing story. So oh, and then uh, yes, I moved to, to Paris. So I, I forgot to say that I was living in the apartment of Manuel ah. in Bologna. So that was another gossip that I forgot. <laughs> yeah. It was very nice. I was living in the apartment of Mana with my my girlfriend, with my English girlfriend that uh, the time was we were together. Mm -hmm. And um, so she loved a lot Paris. So this is also why I was looking for opportunities in France. Mm -hmm. and I saw these opportunities. So we moved in 2012, mm. October 2012. So I quitted Manuel Hart. <laughs> Did you pay? Were you paying properly? Uh, hey, yes, yes. I don't know. It's still uh, no. I, I'm joking. Mm -hmm. anyway, I paid. Um, it was very nice. It was a super old apartment. You know, Bologna is a medieval uh, city, uh -huh. and it was a very old building uh, with the porches in front. A very little garden. It was fantastic, charming place. Strongly recommend it. I don't know, maybe now he's occupied by the other PhD students. Yeah, I think JJ was there for a period, Manu told me, if I'm not mistaken. So that apartment is a very yeah. busy place. Yeah, I think many, many PhD students uh, spent or stayed uh, in Manuel's place. And I, I mean, I uh, really had a good time because uh, it was a fantastic place, very close to the university, not super big, but uh, lovely, cozy. So with the opportunity of eating outside, with a little bit of sun, with the whole buildings, you know, Bologna is a, is a very charming place, very red. The bricks of the, of the buildings are red. Uh, you, you have this feeling of, of you have a welcome, uh, it's a welcoming city. Mm -hmm. You have, um, you have this, this nice feeling when you are in Bologna. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice. Strongly recommend you. you. You haven't been to Bologna, no? Anna? No, I've been to Italy, but not Bologna yet. I still have to visit. Uh, but then you went to Paris uh, uh, and then to Saint Denis, right? Yes. So, so University of Paris 13, which is Paris 13, uh, is um, actually a little bit north of Saint Denis. Ah, okay. It's uh, five kilometers in the north mm. of Saint Denis. Mm. It's in Epinay Viltaneuse, which is uh, another village. So, yeah, I mean, I remember uh, I, it was in 2012, 
Well, we, I remember we had um, a, a very nice apartment, me and my Charlie, my girlfriend at the time. We went to, um, uh, to a place co uh, close to Gare du Nord, which uh -huh. is um, like, uh, there's a train to go to Paris 3, and I was commuting every day. And uh, I mean, I, I had a nice time. Uh, and it was a nice period. But uh, I was also looking for a permanent position. So, and actually, so because in, in France, the system is quite good. So at least at that time, uh, there were many opportunities. So for starting a career, uh, France uh, I, it's, it's a good place. I think one of the best places in Europe. Way better than, uh, than Italy, for sure. Especially after um, the new law that uh, deleted the starting uh, position. So there are two positions in France, like Maître de Conférence, mm -hmm. which is uh, equivalent to assistant, something in, in the middle, between uh, assistant and associate professor. And then you have Professeur des Universités, which is a full professor. So I applied. So you need the qualification as well. So this is also uh, interesting, like uh, if you want to, to apply for a position in, uh, in France, you, know, you need the, the qualification. And to do the qualification, you need to do it in the time window uh, the, I mean, specified by the government. And every year, this time window is at the end of September, beginning of uh, October. Mm. You have to register at that time. If you lose that time window, you lose the entire year. And then you, you get the qualification in February, and then all the, the, the positions are advertised uh, in, a, in a central fashion in March. Mm -hmm. So you have this website. There's, everything is very well organized in France, actually. I like it a lot. So you can log in in the, in the web page and check if there is a position. So you can even check if there's a, a position in Polynesia, for example. <laughs> or you know that France have some yeah. small colonies yeah. like Guyana, yeah, or, yeah, 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 and um, or maybe Mauritius as well. I, I don't know. Yeah, there are many, many little islands. So you have the map of France. So you click on uh, on the region, but you can click also on Polynesia. <laughs> so I think there was a position in informatics, in computer science, but not a position in uh, in operation research at the time. So I applied to to a position in Paris Dauphin, mm. which is uh, uh, the, it's also called Paris, Na Paris Neuf, which is Paris 9. Right, yeah. So you know, after 68, the University of uh, Paris, which was uh, Sorbonne, called the Sorbonne mm. University, mm -hmm. was split in 13 parts. And uh, from 1 to 13. So of course, not all the universities, the universities have uh, uh, all the departments. So, for example, Paris 9, which is uh, Paris Dauphin, my university. So, it's specialized in computer science, math, and economics. Mm. So other universities are specialized in different areas. And, uh, and I got my, my position, Anand. <laughs> I got my first permanent position in the group of uh, Professor Rita Majuba. Yeah. Again, uh, working with some uh, great guy. <laughs> yeah. You've been, you actually so been very fortunate, yeah. I think, right, Fabio? You've been very fortunate to, you know, had you had the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, yeah. great guys. True. I, yes, I mean, I had uh, some good opportunities, and uh, but that was the the turning point. So you know, when you are postdoc, uh, if you don't if you don't manage to to get a permanent position, you are quickly getting yeah, no. out of business. Huh? <laughs> it's black or white. So if you get it, you're super happy. If you don't get it, but I managed to get it. So I mean, I'm really grateful also to read them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, I, mean uh, he, I think he liked me. And at that time, I didn't have many publications. So I had, I think, three, four including mathematical programming, some info journal computing, so some good publications, but not many. Mm. So I think it trusted me and uh, probably also liked the topics. And of course, uh, he, was, he knew my supervisor, he knew a little bit of my story. So probably also that uh, part of my career helped a little bit. 
but uh, I managed to get the position. Yeah, okay. so I was a super super happy. Like I was 30, 30, 31 actually, mm. 31. So in during this period you spent in Paris, uh, both as postdoc and when you found the position, uh, what do you consider your main contributions? So I um, I worked in many topics, uh, but the main contribution I think are on exact algorithm for classical combinatorial optimization programs. So I have some of the state of the art for, for example, for variants of the for the vertex coloring problems. Now I have published um, like uh, exact algorithm for clicks uh, for variant of clicks problem. For example, clicks with the capacity constraint, which is called knapsack conflict, knapsack problem with conflict, and several others. Um, so I think my main contributions are uh, effective and efficient exact algorithms. So based on the knowledge of the structural properties of the program, mm -hmm. I managed to deliver some of state-of-the-art uh, exact algorithms mm -hmm. and also uh, this idea of automatic decomposition of the MIP. I think this is another nice contribution. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah. nobody thought of uh, doing uh, a generic branch and price. Normally branch and price works if it is tailored mm -hmm. for a specific problem. So it's not like a branch and cut. I mean, all the solvers, I mean, Gurobi, Simplex, uh, Express, they implement a branch and cut. Mm -hmm. So there's no fully automatic, there was not fully automatic branch and price algorithm instead of a branch and cut. So that was a big, big breakthrough. I mean, uh, showing that uh, <clears throat> this technique uh, can be applied also to a generic MIP and can be effective, I think is a nice contribution. Great, great. So, I mean, uh, you have to say what are my... Yeah, uh, the yeah no, no, are no, my no. come on, come on. But uh, you... During that time, you also went to U.S. for yeah, yeah once true, or twice, true. I think. Well, this was another nice part of uh, uh, my career, I would say. I mean, I had the opportunity to visit the University of Colorado, Boulder, which is a fantastic place, it's close to the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. It's close to Denver in, uh, in Colorado. And uh, I, I joined my, I was, uh, I went also there because my cousin was doing a PhD at the University of Colorado. So was, I mean, I, I said, why not? I mean, I'm, I can do some research and visit my cousin. I can do both at the same time. So I said, why not? Then I checked uh, on, on, on the internet uh, who, who was working on in operation research at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I saw that uh, Manuel Laguna and Fred Glover yeah. uh, were uh, there. Again, and, uh, very famous and he, names. Yeah, super, <laughs> super top guys. Then I said, uh, I wrote an email to Manuel, said, OK, uh, I, I mean, I would like to come. So he said, yes, I mean, uh, please, uh, you're welcome. And um, so I went to the University of uh, Colorado. Actually, a very nice place. Really strongly recommend it. And uh, um, so during, uh, so I, uh, let me mention also that funny story because uh, it's, uh, super, I mean, it's partially interesting. So during my stay in uh, the, um, at the University of Colorado, uh, Manuel Laguna invited me for the paella uh, ah. thing, it's a super event. Uh, so every Sunday, Manuel was inviting people to stay at uh, his place like eating uh, big uh, big paella so it was super equipped he had like a big pan the rice coming from spain super top quality mm -hmm. then i said okay manuel i am here with my my cousin so can i invite also my cousin to your place then he said okay no problem come uh, with my car come with your cousin and so we went and then uh, after the dinner, also the daughter of Manuel was there. And now, Anna, what do you think? There's now my child <laughs> is married with the daughter of Manuel Laguna. Wow. This is insane. Amazing story. So the, the, the world is uh, is small. Did you attend the wedding? And yeah, I went to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is also a very nice, another super funny part. So we went to the Rocky, Rocky Mountains 
to the ranch of Fred Glover for the wedding. Mm. Fred Glover has a fantastic uh, ranch in the, in the country, in the countryside, in the, actually in the mountains. So with, uh, with the horses, uh, like uh, with the super garden. So we, we celebrated the wedding of uh, Sofia Laguna, the daughter of mm. Manuel and my cousin in the ranch in the open air and I did my speech as well. It was fantastic. And uh, also I remember that during the, after actually the celebration, so I saw Fred Glover writing a paper <laughs> inside of the ranch. So I went there to speak with him. I remember he was doing some, I don't know, he had some idea on how to speed up the simplex method with a new pivoting rule or something like that. I didn't follow too much because we were celebrating. So mm -hmm. we a couple of beers. Were you sober beers. enough to understand what you were saying? No, probably, probably not. I don't <laughs> think so. Ah, uh, that's yeah, we had wonderful. Time. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, we worked uh, uh, a little bit also with Fred, but not that deep. <laughs> you visit also University of Vienna? Uh, yeah, I went to the University of Vienna as well. And um, uh, actually, um, so I think uh, I was visiting Ivana Ljubic, hmm. which was a uh, professor at the time uh, in Vienna. But I think I met uh, Ivana before, so he invited me to to, 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 the, to the University of Vienna to work there. So it was the start of uh, a big uh, collaboration. So I mean, I, I mean, I was very lucky to find uh, to also to work with Ivana. Is a um, yeah. I mean, she, she's super intelligent. Not as Alberto, but don't say to. Uh -huh. she's, she's super strong. She's super strong. So now we have many papers together. We're still working together, and uh, <clears throat> so nice. yeah. I mean, uh, I had <coughs> that opportunity as well. <clears throat> so at that time, Ivana was at the University of Vienna, but mm -hmm. after Ivana came to Paris as well. Mm -hmm. So now she has a, a position at the SEC, which is a business school I call the Commerce mm -hmm. in Paris. So yeah, after Vienna, we, we had the opportunity to even increase our collaborations because mm -hmm. uh, she moved to Paris. Yeah, I mean, uh, and also, so we're friends. So right. I, she invited me a I mean, many times uh, at her place. Uh, I was following also because the the, the, the the son of Ivana came to Paris as well. Mm -hmm. He went first to the Lycée, which is uh, the equivalent of Liceo mm -hmm. in France. And then um, Chadomir, uh, Chadomir is the name of uh, Ivana's son, mm -hmm. went to HOC, which is the competitor of the ESSEC, which is the University of Ivana. Mm -hmm. But they're both top uh, universities. So. Yeah, the, there's a funny thing too. Uh, you know, Marcos Melo, uh, Marcos Melo Silva, uh, yeah. uh, with the help of Maria Batarra, uh, we found him a position uh, at Paris uh, 13, right? And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I think you, you met him there, right? Marcos with long hair. <laughs> and, I remember. I remember. And he worked yeah, with, uh, with Roberto there. And then he did his postdoc with Ivana later. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you see that it's the community, the Italian. I mean, not all Italians. So, yeah, Ivana is from Serbia, mm. but uh, the, the Italian and France uh, community is big. So we have uh, Leo Liberti, Roberto Wolfer Calvo, Emiliano, that I mentioned before, Claudia, mm -hmm. me. That I was uh, in Paris at the time. So and many like postdocs, uh, PhD students. Uh, and Marcos. Yeah, yeah Marcos because, has uh, a, he found an Italian girlfriend, which is, she's very yeah. cool, yeah. Uh, the, and then he speaks no. English with an Italian accent, you know, <laughs> because he has been uh, uh, living with Italians all the time during his PhD and, you know, so. No, we were, uh, we were, uh, we were still friends. I mean, now yeah, I think Marcos is in the south of France. Yeah, he went to Montpellier. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah, I mean, the weather in Paris is not that great, but uh, I think in the south of France, uh, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And then, uh, Fabio, you, there was, I think it was about time to come back to Italy and you 
Yeah, I, mean, I know it's yeah. going to be very, oh. very tough to find a position there, right? But yeah, I mean, finding a position. Manage... It's not easy, huh? no, not very easy finding a position in Italy. So I went back, so I, I got my habilitation dirigé de recherche in, in Paris in 2017. So in order to become a full professor, like professor of this university, as I said, I told you, so you need this habilitation. But in my university, uh, Paris Dauphine, which is Paris 9, so we have this internal rule that in order to do the jump from at the conference to professor, you need to change university. Mm. So you cannot become a full professor in the same university. So then I said, I mean, moving for moving, it's time to, to go back. Like, and also, I mean, uh, after seven years in Paris, it was time for a change. And uh, so also I have my family in Modena. I have Italian roots. Uh, and so uh, You had, so. Uh, for that exam, you had Nelson Macula and Eduardo Show as part of your jury. It was a big uh, Brazilian part. It was uh, two members. They yeah. came for my habilitation dirigé de recherche directly from from Brazil. Yeah, it was super nice. So we celebrated together. I remember it was very nice. But that that was uh, in 2017. Mm -hmm. and, uh, actually, and I moved back to Italy at the end of 2019, actually uh, in January 2020. Mm, just before the, and, the yeah, pandemic. Just before the pandemic crisis. But how was but, the process of finding that position uh, in Rome? Yeah, so, uh, I, I, so my position now is at the CNR, which is the Italian Research National Council, Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca in Italian. And uh, it's, it's a very whole style procedure. So first, uh, you need to wait for a call for, you know, for the open position. So they, they publish uh, like a sort of uh, opening. Or in, I think they did it in 2018. So you prepare your thing, you prepare your CV, you send all the, all the papers. Then you wait. You wait six or seven months. And then they invite the people for a written exam. So can you imagine? <laughs> I, I, I went from Paris. So I thought, I, I think I was, I taught four hours in the morning. Then I took a plane. <laughs> I went to Rome. I slept um, in the place of Fabio D'Andrea Giovanni. Do you know Fabio D'Andrea Giovanni? He's no. another researcher. He's uh, another Italian. Well, he's, he's um, in Compiègne, he's not in Paris, but he's mm. part of the Italian community, mm. you know, Parisian research community. He's um, working in networks, uh, but uh, very related to operation research. Mm. Anyway, I stayed in his place, and then we went to 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 do this exam, this written exam. So I can't imagine. I, mean, I was doing exams for my students, not always doing exams for <laughs> no, myself. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was incredible. But the head, the head of the, the commission was Maria Grazia Speranza. Do you know Maria Grazia yeah, Speranza? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I remember she was dictating the text of the exam. Very Italian. old school, very old school. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I mean, uh, so we, we had two, two written tests, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So one a little bit more generic and one very technical. And that was in, I think, July 2019, yes. So everything started in 2018, and then in uh, July 2019, we had the two written exams. Mm -hmm. Then we waited for the results, of course. Maria Grazia took uh, her time to, uh, to correct uh, everything. And in September, I think we got the results. So it was a big exam, eh? not only for operation research. It was for applied mathematics. Mm -hmm. So there were three positions for applied mathematics, mm -hmm. like automatic controls, uh, calculus, uh, like um, probably also algebra, many things. And um, basically, we got, uh, I think, the, the answer in, yeah, the, as I said, at the end in September. And then we were invited for the oral exam. 
So again, I took my plane from Paris. I think I was also teaching, I don't know why I was not very lucky. So I went to, 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 to Rome. I slept again in the, play, in the place of Fabio Andrea Giovanni, and then I went for the oral exam. So I took the oral exam at the age of 38 again. <laughs> I think they, <laughs> they asked me the complexity classes, something like... Um, no, I mean, they asked me, what is the complexity of the simplex algorithm? This was the question. Mm. Which is a little bit tricky, you know, because mm. in theory, yeah. It's pretty normal that the algorithm that you're using is not. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, I, mean, I asked, I, I mean, it was not a uh, not super difficult question, but uh, it was very formal because uh, I, you have to select. So there was a box with many questions inside. So you have to pick one, uh -huh. run two. I took one on the simplest algorithm. Yeah, that's similar in Brazil, in fact. If you want to get a permanent position uh, in a public university, you usually have to go to a written exam that is uh, selected at random among, say, seven top ten topics. You, so you have to study all of them, and then you have to write about that topic. And then if you pass, uh, you have to do uh, sort of a teaching exam, but you do it a like, couple of days later or, or something like that. And then you have to present uh, some, some of your story, what you have done. Uh, they call it memorial here. And finally, there you have, the, of course, your CV. There should be enough points and you have to compare against the other competitors that are applying for that position. So it's very stressful. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very intense week and it can be really, really tiring. Well, no, but also, <laughs> also for entering the CNR. Actually, I think for entering the university in Italy, you don't have a written exam. You just have uh, an interview, mm -hmm. but for entering the CNR, you have the written exam. The written exam is incredible. Yeah. But you you go there without anything. You have to. So they give you a piece of paper and a pen. Uh, a pen. That's it. Like uh, yeah. When you when I was a student. So Fabio, what about future work? So future work. Uh, so actually, it's not easy eh, to to planify the future right now. I mean, I'm st actually stuck in Modena since uh, one year. Mm. So I didn't tell you, I went to Rome because I mean, I got the position at the CNR and my department is in Rome. So I went to Rome at the end of February 2020. <laughs> and the pandemic start more or less at the time. Yeah. So I remember we were making fun. Oh, don't worry. Nothing is happening. So, I mean, I was I, super unlucky, like, uh, it was incredible. I arrived in Rome and after less than 20 days, everything was completely shut down, it was mm -hmm. closed, closing. And also we, well, at the time, we didn't know anything, like, it was incredible. I remember, we, yes, we received an email saying, maybe two weeks, you will be back in two weeks. <laughs> so I left my toothbrush, my luggage, I left everything in Rome. And then I went home and I took a train. Like, so at that time, it was impossible to find a mask. I remember I was wearing a, a, a scarf. Oh. It was super scary, like nobody was, um, it was completely empty. The station was full of policemen. Oh, incredible. Mm -hmm. But the first part that I left everything in Rome. <laughs> and then, you know what happened. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> so we got stuck for one year. I yeah. went back to Rome actually in September, only in September last year. Mm -hmm. And I stayed another 10, 10 days. You know, in uh, September, we had the impression that the situation was a little bit better, getting uh, probably to normality, but it was not true. So mm -hmm. I stayed other 10 days and they shut down the building again. So I went back to Modena. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope we have... Uh, oh, we yeah. Have I mean, this is super bad. Super bad. Mm -hmm. Fabio, uh, you you definitely have a very interesting life. Uh, I, I, I had a lot of fun hearing all of these uh, wonderful stories. Some of them are really unique <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah and uh, i think you've been fortunate to work with great guys and visit 
uh, I don't know, five, six different countries uh, as postdoc uh, position or as a visiting researcher doing or, or your PhD and after that. So even before when you went to Ireland. So uh, for me, it was uh, very, very entertaining. I'm very grateful that you accepted uh, this invitation and to share yeah. all of this. So thank yeah, you very thank much. You, uh, yeah, for this opportunity it was, uh, I think it's very nice. And also in this time, to at least to have a feeling of being part of the community. We're not going to any conferences. We're not speaking to anybody. Yeah. At least we have some moments of... Yeah, of connection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least to have the feeling that we are still together or yeah, the community is still alive something like that yeah. you know. so of course uh you were most welcome to visit us uh, in João Pessoa uh maybe you can set my place like you you, <laughs> you like to stay at you know your friends places or you can stay here maybe I don't know and uh well I maybe will be over soon huh? I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully this, this 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 disaster will be over I know that in Brazil, Anan, uh, Anan yeah. is. Uh, I don't even want to talk about that. It's it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. Yeah, you cut this thing as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay, Fabio. So uh, I hope to see you soon, and best of luck uh, there in Modena, and of course when you go back to Rome. And ciao, bye. <laughs> ciao, ciao.